Hi all, welcome to my channel, welcome to my world, this is The World Away. Today something completely different from model building and something that I think you'll all get quite a lot out of. Um, basically I'm interviewing my brother Mick Green who's just wrote his first book, The Skirmishers. And in today's sort of podcast talking head video, we're talking about his life in the military and the transition from military to Civvy Street and then from Civvy Street writing a first book. So if you are uh, a fan of literature, a fan or an author out there who's looking to publish their first book, or you do have an interest in militaria and anything to do with the military, when I know a lot of you have because the most viewed build videos on the channel at the moment, the U-Boat and the Lancaster Bomber, you are going to get a lot out of this podcast. Now, all the links to the skirmishers is in my video description, but I really do hope you like this podcast. Check it out now. Today I'm here with Michael Green, or Mick Green, this is my brother, and uh, he's basically wrote a book called The Skirmishers. This is your first book, but uh, before we go into this book, uh, I want to find out all about you. Or I know all about you, <laughs> but the people out here don't know anything about you. So what we want to know is uh, your life, pretty much, from childhood to sitting here in a workshop with World of Wayne. <laughs> Growing up with World of Wayne. Yeah. <laughs> Huh. That's gonna. That, that's a podcast in itself. <laughs> that, that would be. Yeah. Uh, maybe we uh, we do that. We we prepare that for another time. Okay. Um. So uh, I suppose that uh, like you, we grew up in Essex. Mm -hmm. Um. And I started off. Uh. In. Well, we were Australian first, weren't we? Oh yeah, yeah. So well, so I was born in Essex. Yeah. Moved to Australia in 1972. I, I weren't alive. No, you weren't. <laughs> you you came in Australia. Uh, and then uh, I so grew up there until we, I was about eight or nine years old, and then we moved back to Essex again. Mm -hmm. uh, and then obviously finished my schooling like you did. Now uh, everyone knows Essex. part of your schooling, your rhinoceros story. So they they know about your literary efforts from school. That's, that's, <laughs> that's why people should get the book, right? Yeah. <laughs> is is the rhinoceros story? I couldn't believe you dug that out. Yeah, that that is amazing. I've got a good <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in fact, I, I remember talking to my wife about it, and she was she was going, "What's that all about?" And I couldn't remember to start with. And then, funny enough, a few days after I I saw it appear, it start, started coming back to me. It was quite strange how the brain works. And yeah. goes, actually, I remember that. And I'm still, by the way, it's still my favourite animal by a long way. The rhinoceros. I'm. Uh, we, we went to the zoo in. So I live in Australia right now, and we'll get to that. But but we went to the zoo in Canberra, and they've got rhino there. Right. And and that's the one thing I wanted to head towards is the rhinoceroses. I don't know why I'm drawn to them, but it's uh, I just think they're pretty cool creatures, and they sort of remind me of the uh, the dinosaur era. I think God. I don't just so so amazing. But anyway, um, so yeah, we we spent some time in Australia together. Yeah. Um, got a bit of an accent if you remember the old. Remember yeah. we used to do the old tapes for yeah. uh, for our nan and granddad. Um, when we played them back. Both me and Wayne have got Australian we got, we got accents. Thick back Australian then. accent. Yeah, re really thick. And I know that some people are listening to this podcast and think I've got an Australian accent. Um, for most Australians, I'm a pommy, right? Yeah. So I've got a pommy accent. So so it might not come across that way. Um, so we moved back to Essex. We grew up in uh, Basildon. Yeah. So we're 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 Essex boys. At the and it's a, and in Basildon, you uh you already had an interest in the military. I don't know if it's through our dad being in the military or what, but you. You had joined the Air Training Corps, hadn't you? So yeah, I had. I think my dad uh, probably recognised that I wasn't doing so well at school at a particular time, <laughs> and wanted to guide, you know, say to me that there's other options out there. And I'll come on to why the military is so good, I guess, for working class boys. Yeah, and um, and we'll we'll come on to that as I talk a little bit about my life, I suppose. But anyway, um, we we both went to the same school. We yeah. lived in the same area. Mm -hmm. uh, proper sort of um for the, the more global audience sort of east london housing estate yeah uh, every house looks the same you can get lost on that housing estate if you do if you didn't grow up there um but a, a, an interesting place to grow up obviously coming from australia to the uk for both of us was a bit of a culture shock i think mm -hmm. um and the, the things i remember like the level was football yeah. soccer for the global audience um in the uk is like 20 percent, 30 percent above where Australia was at at the time. Yeah. So when we actually joined football clubs over here, um, and I'm in the UK at the moment, obviously, that's why I'm here with Wayne, um, it was um, it was a bit of a shock, the standard, mm -hmm. compared to what we were playing in, in Australia. That's changed a little bit over the years. Um, anyway, so uh, left school and I worked uh, in retail, and I think for most kids coming out of school in that era it would be factories it would be going yeah. to london working in london retail you didn't which really was... do that though did you? you 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 were more retail and that was kind of like a saturday job that just 
it became yeah, more like a... It did. Uh, I mean, it, again, I don't know how much of a shock it is for most people, but, um, you know, we were working Thursday night, Friday night, yeah. and all day Saturday, and school was completely secondary. I mean, let's yeah. face it, it was it was a fairly tough school we went to. So it was... Um, uh, and, and some people came out of, of school, and, and maybe there were some viewers that, that would recognise us from school and did really well, but I certainly wasn't doing that well when I was when I was at school and so that's what led me so 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 basically from working in a freezer so I worked in a yeah. freezer for a while which was one of the best jobs in the world by the way uh, because a you work on your own and when people want to talk to you they you can't hear them because yeah. you're wearing the big suit and the fans are blasting on you every, plus in the summer because I worked in freezers as well in yeah. the summer is a great place to be <laughs> it was yeah it was it, it was um it, it, it's one of those fond memories where uh you know, you've got no, you, you leave work at the end of the day and you've got nothing to worry about. So we went, we went from there and, and suddenly this is where the direction you talked about yeah. came in. It's well, what are you going to do with your life at that point? And I had been uh, for, for two and a half years in the uh, Air Training Corps, which is a great organisation for kids that are thinking about going into the military. And that was and, 224 Free Squadron in Basildon, yeah? Yeah, it may well have been. Jeez, so I still well remember. Done. Yeah, yeah, I still you remember more than me. There's a lot of water under the bridge since then. And um, yeah, I turned up at the careers office in uh, South End on Sea. Oh, I think it's actually close to Westcliff, if I'm honest yeah. with you. Uh, but but uh, in South End on Sea, and um, and then applied to join the military in the ranks. Um, and I and I'll come on to the, the reason why I'm differentiating at the moment. And and I you know I was accepted and joined up as a, a supplier, as they call it, or mm -hmm. logistics. So in the logistics area. So I uh, did my uh, training at RF Swinderby, which is where everybody went to. Um, and back in those days, it was the short, sharp shop treatment. <laughs> you were shouted at a lot, but it was more, you know, taking you from being a civilian and preparing you to, you know, be a military person, if you like, um, begin the institutionalization of you, I suppose, um, and turn you into, uh, you know, mold you into what they, they, they want you to be. And so I, I went from there to my trade training, which was at RF Hereford, which is now mm -hmm. the home of the SAS. So wow. um, the SAS <laughs> moved to Credden Hill um, quite a long time ago now uh, and uh, had a great time there. I mean, that was it was almost a party from start to finish, <laughs> to be honest with you. The logistics training was great and we had some fantastic instructors um, that looked after us. And then from there, I went to RF Coldershaw up in Norfolk, which was a, a Jaguar base. Yeah. And it's probably about only about three years into that where um, the Berlin Wall had come down, options for change, as they called it, coming. So the, the, the RAF when I joined was at about 95,000 and they cut it to about 53,000 wow. almost overnight. It was within a couple of years. Uh, there's an irony in what I'm about to say that. They, they cut overnight. So during that first two years that I was in, all of the roles that we had would be Cold War roles. Yeah. So my war role was in Norway. Mm -hmm. um, but we were fighting for work. You know, you had a lot of characters in the military at that time to try and keep a force of just 95,000 in the Air Force yeah. alone. You can imagine the characters we were bringing in. And, and it was a really, <laughs> really good time uh, to be in the military. Uh, we then, um, but during that time, I realized that with cutting the force to 55,000, my chances of promotion at that time were going to be limited. It was going to take, you know, quite a while to go from SAC, Senior Aircraft, yeah. to Corporal at that time. So... I thought, well, what can I do? And I looked at careers outside of the military, even that early on. So I was only sort wow. of three years in and then realized that school was important and I <laughs> needed to go and get some qualifications. And this is what, where I talk about the military. Yeah. It's really good. The military do give you options to do that. And so if you ever wanted to get out of, you know, you, you know and I'm proud of my working class background, yeah. but if you ever wanted, um, there is a term for it, a sociology term. Is it M. Paul Glassman? I've got no idea. Like that. <laughs> anyway, if you ever wanted to try and get out of the situation you're in, the military is 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 fantastic for doing it. And so I started going to night school and mm -hmm. um, ended up not not realizing why. In my head, I was thinking I'm going to night school because I'm thinking about leaving the military. Uh, and I think it was about I, I'd got three O levels at the time. I was looking at doing two more and then potentially an A level. When you you normally get an influence, there was one officer who said to me, "Why are you doing this?" And I mm -hmm. I, I said. Well, because I'm thinking about leaving. And he said, well, why don't you tick the top box? And the top box happened to be commissioning. Yeah. And so that set me on a sort of different path. I'm thinking, well, geez, if somebody thinks that I'm able to commission <laughs> and be an officer, then, you know, maybe I should I should consider it. So 
Uh, the irony, I just want to loop back to the irony of the, the cutting of the military at that particular yeah. time. So we had really no work in a Cold War role up until 1990. And then, yeah. of course, we had the Gulf War in 19, 1991. And then after that, um, the, the sort of areas I was on, there was deployments every year that yeah. you, could, you could go on up until almost the present, well, certainly to the late 2018 or whatever it is wow. for the military. I was out by then. But, um, yeah, there, we got busier. As we got smaller, it was it was just so bizarre wow. to see to see that happen. So uh, so anyway, I, I, I bridge over. So RF Coldishall, fantastic base, old Battle of Britain. Um, no longer uh, there, station. is it? No longer there. Unfortunately, a lot of the British bases have gone there. Yeah. Um, it was Douglas Bader's station from memory. He was station commander wow. there back in the day, so it's got a lot of history. Unfortunately, it's um, it's not there as a military base anymore, and I haven't I, I haven't been back, but. I know that anyone who served there would have some fond memories <laughs> of our times at, at RF Coldishall. Uh, I was then promoted to Corporal uh, and went to RF Marham, which um, at the time I was there had the nuclear deterrent. Yeah. Uh, so that just meant a lot of guarding, yeah. if I'm honest with you. Um, and I specialised in fuels at that time. Uh, again, another great base, unfortunately, in the middle of nowhere. So yeah. not seven miles away from Norwich, which <laughs> Coldishall was, which meant that we had some really good nights out. Uh, and then I'd gone to the Falklands in that time, um, was lucky enough uh, in the late 90s to go to uh, southern Italy, um, which is again part of the north-south no-fly zone uh, over Iraq. And then, um, and then literally as I came back from there, um, was accepted for commission. Wow. Um, and so then went to RFC Cranwell yeah. uh, to, do my, uh, to do my commissioning. <laughs> um, and then... After coming out of that, I was, po I was posted to RF Bryce Norton as um, OC Base Supply Flight. Yeah. So looking after basically large warehousing during Gulf War II. Yeah. Um, my, my flight sergeant is a top guy. Um, I, I won't mention anyone's names because I'd have to ask yeah. permission, but top guy, he was deployed out uh, mm -hmm. for Gulf War II. Uh, so uh, yeah, I found myself looking after one of the largest warehouses um, in the military like on, on an operational air base uh, with a great bunch of people yeah um and, and because it was my first posting as a commission officer i know i can't remember the corporal's name and i said i wouldn't mention names but <laughs> they had all done a check on me before coming in so they phoned marum up and phoned <laughs> up and what's he like and, and and i got out of it really well those guys really looked after me um but the challenge of running a warehouse probably wasn't that great for me having been at that time in logistics for over 10 years um, yeah so i decided to uh, specialize in air movements and mm -hmm. um and, uh, and and you know, be a logistics officer, but but with a special movement, uh, a, a specialisation in air movements. So so what what do air movements do? So so basically, we're trained to um, load, lash an aircraft, so tie stuff into an aircraft, trim the aircraft, uh, and work with the air movements mustering. So um, in the uh, I'll try and make this more global. So in the RAF. Um, Air movements is a separate trade right. in the RAAF because people know that I did an exchange with the RAAF as well. Yeah. Um, air movements at that particular time was part of the supply mm -hmm. trade, so there wasn't two different trades. It sort of changed a little bit now, um, but but anyway, uh, so I so I did the air movements course, which is quite a long course, and then I uh, went to a unit called uh, UK MAMS, United Kingdom mobile air movement squadron as a as a team leader so uk mams has, has been set up to support the um the ref capability so the uh, major air assets so things like c-130s yeah. c-17s um, now it would be the the atlas um uh, the, the a400m yeah uh all over the world so anywhere in the world that they're, they're set up to do it both in operational theaters and also um you know major exercises yeah. supporting uh what we would call rr assets um <laughs> Uh, uh, around the world, and so that took me to the Middle East m multiple times, uh, and it, and luckily enough, it took me to a number of other countries around the world as well. So yeah, so it took me to the Middle East, uh, took 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 me all over the world uh, to some places that you just don't get to go to. So it was really cool working with, um, you know, I've got to say that the guys that are in the ranks uh, in UK managers you've got to understand these people are away for. 270 plus days a year wow. uh, they love their job uh, we sort of come in as as officers and it's part of a rite of passage almost for us yeah. to some extent uh, we certainly um, leave an impression mm -hmm. uh, when we go in there but the um, certainly the sergeants flight sergeants um, and warrant officers who look after you on there you know they're, they're worth the weight in gold if you get good ones there, there's no doubt about it and for the teams themselves for the the SACs and corporals um, 
it's it's an it's an incredible life for a young person. There, yeah. There's no doubt about it. Traveling around the world, uh, but I, I hasten to say there's good and bad. Yeah. You go to the bad places. So that's the um, and bad places. I mean, you know, the kinetic places. And when you're yeah. younger in the military, uh, that's uh, that's what you join for, right? And yeah. I know I know it can be crazy when you're talking to civilians about going to operational areas, but you've got to remember that that's what you're trained to do. Yeah. So when you first go to an operational area, it's um it's exciting. Mm -hmm. That's probably the way, the way I'd describe it. Uh, by the third time, maybe less exciting and maybe yeah. you're a little bit more over it. Um, and, and, you know, people go m multiple times, a lot more times than, than, than I, I went. So uh, during that tour, I then become the OPSO, so uh, the, the mobile operations officer, which is pretty cool because you, you get to get all the latest intelligence, what's yeah. going on in the world, and, um, uh, uh, and to make sure that you're... Uh, in a position to plan and then execute, you know, whatever mission the government of the day want you to uh, uh, to uh, to prosecute. Mm -hmm. And then uh, it was quite funny. The reason I took the OPSO job is because the um, my boss, again, I won't mention the name, but a good friend of mine, uh, he said to me, look, if you become the OPSO, you're in a relationship with an Aussie. Um, I can get you this Australian exchange for two and a half years. Now, if you're in the British military, there's a big risk on my part because these things don't normally play out that way, as you know. Yeah. But to be fair to him, uh, by the time it had come to me sitting down with a desk officer who at that time used to be um, an administrator, uh, they, they basically said, well, it may as well say, you know, Mick Green for this role. There's nobody else that could do it um, because of the qualifications that you yeah. needed to have at that particular time. So then I found myself with the with the RWF for two and a half years, which was uh, which was pretty cool, and it also meant obviously um, that I, you know, was going to spend two and a half years with my partner and, and yeah. now my wife uh, over serving with the Australian military, which was pretty cool. And one of the one of the things that I was able to do when I was down there, which I'm really lucky, it doesn't really happen to, mm -hmm. um, it doesn't really happen with Australia, uh, sorry, Australian with exchange officers that often is um, I was able to deploy to an operational theater with the with the Australian military as well um, and and subsequently got awarded the Australian Active Service Medal which is unusual for a uh, um, I suppose a foreign officer yeah. uh, going over there so that was pretty cool and then the last um, the last two years in the military um, was you know you find make a role I think more than anything else because right. I think they knew that my my future lied in um, in Australia and so I went to RF Holt and to train logistics officers, which is actually pretty cool. I feel like you're giving something back. Yeah. Uh, and then, um, and then I departed the military um, to join my wife, who is currently a senior officer yeah. in the RWF. So I then had to work out what what you do when you leave the yeah. military. It's mm -hmm. a it's a huge culture shock. So that was 22 years. So mm -hmm. um, I've really, really gone lightly <laughs> over everything that I've done whilst I was in the military, but the 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 main thing for me is that that transition and there's a lot of people giving some really good advice on transition from the military it is a culture shock you, you don't realize how institutionalized you are yeah. until you leave the military and the sort of things um the sort of things that you lack uh whilst you're in the military uh, are things like financial acumen and yeah. you know, how to run a business all, all of that sort of stuff. it's not really taught to you it doesn't matter whether you work you know whether you're working in an ipt an integrated project team yeah. which is probably the closest to that or you're you know, like me, an operational uh, operational officer, you don't understand what what money drives in the commercial <laughs> sector. Uh, so what did I do? Rather than go into the civil service or the Australian equivalent, the Australian public service, I, I joined Coca-Cola. <laughs> so, um, so I worked for Coke for just short of a year. Um, what it gave me, there's two things that it did for me. Number one is that um, I thought the logistics the, the Coca-Cola, the way Coca-Cola do yeah. logistics would be different to the way military do logistics. And some, to some extent, there was, there was things the military would, that, that was doing was probably better. Yeah. The biggest difference was technology. The technology that Coca-Cola had was, was just phenomenal. Some of wow. the stuff that they had avail available to them was, was incredible. And then the other thing they gave me, which was business acumen from day one, yeah. Like I was shown a profit and loss sheet on day one, wow. and that and that for me was where you know outside my comfort zone, yeah. my eyes were really really wide. You know, why is everybody interested in this? So I led teams, you know, in the Middle East, uh -huh. and then suddenly I'm talking to someone who's getting excited about this 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 um, <laughs> this this this, this uh, a statement, you know, this financial statement, and I'm like, well, and and they got me interested in that, which was really good, and then I went from there. I joined. Um, uh, um, 
uh, a company that that works for defense so um a, a company at the time called nova systems uh, so that's you know obviously still going and thriving today and i i nova do commercial work and they yeah. did um and and they do uh, defense work out there so you sort of get the best of both worlds and then in the last year i've transitioned to a company called gold group which yeah. I'm, I'm now ceo of gold group wow. uh, in australia but you um you, you've taken a lot of your skills that you've learned from your time in the military and that's basically dictated your career outside in civvy street hasn't it because you've used a lot of those skills in coca-cola and nova systems and yeah, I think so. I think, um, you know, do you believe in fate? I mean, that's probably, yeah. you know, one of the things that a lot of military people talk to. Things happen for a reason. There's no doubt about that. And I think that um, the Coca-Cola situation at the time, I wasn't sure I'd made the right decision. But interestingly enough, you're right that there was some stuff yeah. that I gave to Coke that they actually adopted. Um, and they were a great company for yeah. just adopting stuff that they thought was going to benefit them um, that, that I took from the military. And then from Coca-Cola into sort of Nova and in, into Gold Group, mm -hmm. the, the business financial acumen and some of the stuff that Coke had yeah. has followed through, you know, from from, from that experience as well. But you're, I think that what a lot of people leave in the military underestimate is their skill sets are valuable. Yeah. Um, and, and I think there are some great companies out there that, that have programs, uh, programs for military people now. Wow. And I've just noticed here in the UK, and I forget what it's called now, um, but there's an operation that's just been launched for ex-military people. Wow. So look it up. Um, we might edit that in. Yeah. At the end, I'll, I'll quickly uh, Google it on, 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 um, on the BBC. But it, it's, um, the, it, it's great that the British government seems to be getting behind uh, the, the, the military transition process, which is wow. really good. If I could change one thing, a few years ago, um, I attended uh, an Evictus Games um, pre-event uh, where they had, I think, British, American, Canadian, um, and UK representation for for what they call the resettlement packages, and of course, yeah. America and Canada that will blow you away what they get from a resettlement perspective compared to maybe the British and Australian military at the time. But the one thing that I suppose the one point I wanted to make is that it's really important that from the day that somebody joins the military, yeah. prepare them to leave. I know it sounds really weird, wow. <laughs> but if you do that, then you'll find that you'll end up certainly in the procurement areas and the IPT areas is that you'll end up with better people because they'll have business acumen. Yeah. And a lot of the time, I think, you know, business or commercial acumen is, is where the military, the military probably suffers the most. Wow. But if every person has a business sense about them and they're being prepared to leave, it might make that transition easier. Okay. Yeah. So in terms of timeline then, when did you leave the military? 2010. Officially. 2010. So the pandemic hit in 2020. Yeah. When did you start to get the idea of writing a book? Because that <laughs> is completely sort of like left field yeah, from is. everything you just described to me. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so the idea for the skirmishers and um, it, actually I had a different title in my head uh, before I, before I started. Um, but the idea was in my head for a long time. In fact, my oldest son, Zach, I'd yeah. mentioned it to him years ago. I don't know if he remembers it. I mentioned that I've got this idea for a book. But it, like a lot of people, it just stays in your head. But I, I was going through uh, um, another period of transition within uh, the company I just mentioned, Nova. Um, part of Nova is a company called GVH, and um, I, applied, I applied to be the chief operating officer mm -hmm. and got the job the same day that my wife had um, been posted to Canada, wow. mm -hmm. which... Um, on paper, yeah, that sounds great. So don't feel sorry for me. Canada is a wonderful country, but of course, <laughs> something was coming yeah. at that point. Um, and so I did a deal with the um, with the managing director of um, Nova Systems International, and that part of that deal was that I do six months in the UK yeah. from January twenty twenty. So you can see how this is all setting yeah. up quite nicely. Um, the pandemic followed us from Singapore and, and it was a commercial aerospace company. So you can imagine that it was, it was a challenging six months, but anyway, I carried on actually doing that for a lot longer into, into 2021. I, I, I did the COO role and, and started doing it from Canada. Yeah. Now, as the door started opening up and everything started opening up again, of course, you can't be a chief operating officer yeah. in another country. Um, when you, when your workforce is in the, in the UK, um, but COVID, did me a favor to some extent is yeah. that I was able to do uh, some work remotely. So like anything you restructure, 
Yeah. And um, I tried to do myself out of a job. And on that <laughs> same day, a colleague of mine and, and a good friend phoned me up to see whether I was interested in coming back to Australia, which obviously I still had another year and a bit, year and a half left in Canada. I said no. And then um, he said, well, what if you do some part-time work for us in sort of business planning and capability development? Um, I said, yes, why not? But yeah. that, I'm getting to your answer. Yeah. So <laughs> I suddenly found myself only having to work, you know, um, for four hours a day, right? right yeah. um, and in the evening. Mm -hmm. So it left the days free. And, and, and in the winter, obviously, once the kids went to school, I was able to go into Quebec and go skiing. Yeah. So again, don't feel sorry for me. But the book idea started burning away at me is that yeah. should I should I write should I start writing this book and get this idea down and so um I started typing yeah um at first I actually tried to talk have you ever tried to do that I've tried to think yeah yeah it's really hard it I is, didn't realize how hard I, I didn't want to use my pen. I, like, I'm a two-finger typer right so I so you went straight for the to, straight for the the like the word processor you didn't it wasn't pen to paper for you no 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 yeah. no because I, yeah. I had it in my head and yeah and, and you know when, when I say I had it in my head I don't want to exaggerate. I got 60,000 words out in like a blink of an eye. Wow. Like, like it would have been, I reckon within a two week period, I would have had a number of the chapters already done. Everything was down on paper. The last 20,000 was pretty hard. It's about 80,000 yeah. words, the book. Uh, the last 20,000 were, were a lot harder and probably stretched it out. That's probably yeah. another six months, if you like, of, of, you know, before the editing process itself. And then you've got to make the decision as to what you're going to do with the book, right? Yeah. It might be there on the laptop, but you're going to make the decision. But the idea um, the idea for the skirmishes, and I, I, I guess that that's a question that you're going to ask, is where, where does the idea come from? It is related to some of the military yeah. um, situations I found myself in. Uh, certainly um, in the kinetic environment, so yeah. kinetic, I mean, warlike in, in environments. Um, that there's a lot of things that, I think if you talk to some members of the military, they'd say like this big thing about fate, um, mm -hmm. people being in the right place at the right time, or unfortunately the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah. Um, I always found that really, I don't know, like when I had time to think about it, I found that, um, uh, I don't know, what's the word I'm looking for? I found that enlightening is probably yeah. the word I'm looking for, is that, you know, um, you don't need to believe in God or, or religion to suddenly have a, a, a faith in fate itself yeah. is that I think if your time's up, it's up. There's mm -hmm. nothing you're going to do about it. It's going to find you. Um, I truly believe in that with some of the situations that I've, I've witnessed and I've, I've sort of seen and been part of uh, on operations. And then um, again, the characters and some of the people that are mentioned in the book, I've met people like that. like that and then obviously because it's a book you yeah maybe blown it up a little bit more yeah. but there are some really interesting people in the world <laughs> today so that that's one thing to, to 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 get across and um and and i can point you to podcasts where yeah. go and listen to some of those people and you'll you'll understand what they're what they're capable of doing but working alongside um uh, and when i say look, working alongside that's probably the wrong term supporting uk special forces um, having people from the intelligence services coming through. Um, and there's, there's, you know, one or two individuals who you don't really know anything about them, but what you do know is places like the foreign and Commonwealth offices, gravity moves around these individuals yeah. when they suddenly turn up, you realize that there's more to them than, than you would, you would, you would ever know. And that's some of those characters, I guess, yeah. um, have appeared in the book. Yeah. Um, but like I said, maybe, maybe. <laughs> embellished a little bit more in, in order to make it a more interesting interesting read uh, to some extent maybe not though because like i said if i point to some podcasts um which i'm happy to do in a minute um you'll realize that that there are some truly incredible people out there that would do some amazing things i suppose for our safety yeah right and and i know that people say well you're in the military it's down at you as well but i was in the air force right yeah um and um you know it, it's it it is it's remarkable what people are prepared to do. I suppose that's yeah. that's what I want to say. And, and and the infrastructure that supports them is what I guess that we as enablers, you know, put put into place. Now, so, I, I've spoke to I've spoke to quite a few authors. Mm. I've got a friend who's an author as well, and uh, they're talking about their writing style and how that they have set points that they need to be in a book and stuff like that. But you mentioned. You had 60,000 words in your mind that you could get out straight away. So was you writing the whole thing chronologically? 
Yeah, I did. I did for this book. Uh, and it's really interesting you say that. I'm not sure I'm going to do that for the next book. Right. But And the reason that I would say that is that for if I write the next book, I've got some chapters that I think are complete in my head. Yeah. But the lead up to those chapters, I probably haven't got quite right in my head. So I might write um, in a different in a different style. I'm not sure. But this one was always going to start in Afghanistan. Right. Um, and obviously that had to be an event that leads to the skirmishers being involved um, yeah. on the on the streets of London. And so where I said I'd, I'd, I'd written the 60,000 words, the 20,000 came in um, as a result of, I suppose, trying to tie the story together. Right. I knew where I wanted to get to for the that, that particular book. And I suppose that's the only, the, the probably the last 20,000 only bit where I had to put extra words in. Yeah into the chapters that were already written. Right, gotcha. And then after that, um, um, I'll advertise a company. Because I, 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 I was in North America, I went to Kirkus, yeah. who are a, a, a company that would do editing for you. Um, and they taught me a lot. The editors taught me a lot about um, the the process of the way people read books. Yeah. Never really thought about it when I was writing the book, obviously. But repetition within a book, for instance, means someone's going to put the book down. Yeah. And the editors are are trained to work out when are people going to start switching off right. wow. on the reader, but when will the book you know, be put down? And so there was a couple of things that are quite funny, obviously. I, 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 uh, I write, obviously, yeah. in, in UK English, yeah. and I give it to an American. Everything came back <laughs> spelt differently, and I'm like, well, well it's a global audience, and, yeah. and I, I think I can, get a, I can get away with that. And then obviously the, the the other issue, and I'm quite happy to hold my my hands about it, uh, up about it, is is grammar. Yeah. You know, we we were brought up in Essex. Yeah. <laughs> um, and in fact, if just to make you know a few Australians laugh, I mean, when we moved to Australia, we moved to Adelaide to Elizabeth. Yeah. Which is not that much different. A lot of people take from Essex yeah. at the end of the day. So grammar, um, I would have needed some support. You know, yeah. on the grammar side, um, where I'm not going to claim I got it from. So, did you have to do a lot of rewrites from their edits or anything like that? Or yeah, the, the, there's only a couple. Uh, one editor wanted me to um, create the need for the skirmishers doing what they were doing to to enhance the need, yeah. if you like. Um, which was good advice. I didn't take it as far as they wanted me to take it, though. Yeah. Uh, and the others was around speech. Yeah. So there's a lot of speech in the book, a lot of dialogue uh, yeah. within the book as well. So just getting the flow right on the speech meant that I had to had to do quite a bit of editing in that space. And it went through three different editors. So right. you, you obviously got to look at continuity, yeah. make sure the names are correct. Uh, Everything I've got a fixation with the name Stephen. <laughs> like I, I use Stephen and Stevenson and stuff like that. And and you become like anybody who's done any major documents will know you sometimes become word blind to yeah. what you're actually writing. So that's the reason you need a really good editor because they'll pick up on things that you haven't you haven't picked up on. Yeah. Um, and in this book, of course, because I try and use radio procedure, mm -hmm. uh, making sure that the call signs are correct yeah. that I flow through. I think I got that wrong when I first read it myself. Wow. You know, how do I get two different uh, two different call signs? But that you know, I'm getting really into the detail yeah. right now. Is is that 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 was it really? Um, there were some changes from a you know, suggestion perspective that the yeah. editors would come up with. Maybe you would want to consider this, um, which was all, all super useful. But then, you know, fast forward to the three edits, then I get the book back, it's edited, it's ready to go. And then we move back to Australia from, yeah. from Canada. And so it nearly stayed on the laptop. You know, a yeah. lot of people would say, I'm a, people think I'm a confident person. I guess I am in a lot of respects, but... Um, so if this was a non-fiction book, I think um, I would have released it and I'd have been quite happy to fight yeah. for it because most non-fiction books are about business and I, uh -huh. you know, it's what you believe in uh, from a business perspective. So you would, there is absolutely no doubt in the world that I would have put that out and I wouldn't have been worried about it. When you're putting out a fictional book, um, I think people look at you differently. Yeah. I, I honestly do. I think you, 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 people are getting into that sort of, uh, into your brain and thinking, well, that's that must be what you think, and of course, yeah. it's not true. You're making stuff up, no. but um, you know, with with the book, and and I know you did it as well. Yeah. Going, wow, it's pretty raunchy in places. Yeah, mm. and 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 I'm going back, going, oh, is it? 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, it, it is, but it's a long time ago. Isn't, isn't that normal? Isn't, isn't isn't that just normal normal life? In fact, you, yeah. you you're one of a few people to come back and go. There's not enough violence in it, which yeah. worries me about my brother. I got to say, um, but but the um, but I tried to make it reflect life. I didn't I didn't want to sort of uh, sugarcoat anything, you know, with, yeah. within it. Yeah, there's there's clearly it's got to be written so that it's um it's it's an interesting reading. It's exciting yeah. read. So some stuff's been embellished. But there's a lot in there that you could draw a parallel to something that's happened, yeah. um, you know, uh, or an experience or someone I've met or something yeah. like that. There, there's a lot you could draw parallels to that there's no doubt about it. But um, yeah, so, so I suppose that you feel a bit more raw when you're releasing that that book. So it nearly stayed on the laptop. Uh, I gave it to my, to my wife and um, she read it and she would probably be my biggest critic and said, yeah. oh, it's a bit of a page turner. So that's where I started going. Well, maybe, maybe yeah. I will go for self-publishing. So when I, I I got back, so you get two options, right? Yeah. You can try and find an agent and go yeah. through that. I just haven't got the time for it. The only reason I didn't do it, yeah, I just did not have the time to do that. So if there's any agents listening now, please read it, <laughs> and and you can and you can have my second book. There, there's no <laughs> doubt about it if you like it. But the, um, but the the next step was to work with an Australian self-publishing company, mm -hmm. which I did, ASPG. Um, and they, um, uh, they, I suppose, gave me the tools to take it from the laptop to the print version that you've got there today or the Kindle yeah. or whatever. And, and what they do is they just do the publishing side for you, the marketing. Yeah. Um, you know, you're pretty much doing yourself, although yeah. they, they, they've advertised it in certain places. I mean, it's everywhere. If you go on the internet right now and put the skirmishes, Mick Green, it, might, it might be worth just holding it there everywhere. that this this book is available on Amazon. But the, um, the even though Mick's talked about the military side and all of that, military section of this book is minimal. It's probably the first 15 yeah. pages. The actual book centers around this special forces group that have done the transition, like you were talking about, from military to Civvy Street and how they're getting on in Civvy Street. One of them gets embroiled in an East End London gang. So it's all about uh, kind of like the the, the 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 urban war, if you like, between the Special Forces unit and some of the gangs in the East End. So that's sort of like the synopsis on the book. Um, but for a first time writer, I really enjoyed this, I have to say. And as you like, I'm going to yeah. say like, like <laughs> I know that you're going, well, that's your brother. Yeah. He's going <laughs> to no, say no, that. No. no, we don't work like that. No, 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 trust no. me. But, the, but, so, but what I thought was the biggest challenge for me, and I, I did say this to um, Mrs. Wilderwain, was that this special forces group comprised, I think it's 10 characters, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, dude. So trying to keep track of that as a first time writer of 10 characters and where they are at what time in the book and all of that, that must have been challenging. So there must have been some planning that you're putting down to know where the characters are. Yeah, it's a really good point. So so I, I got to say that I'm, I'm lucky that the publishing company also, they send the book forward for review. Yeah. And, and the book won an award, which I was really, wow. you know, I was really quite shocked about. It won a gold award. But the... The reason I say that is that one of those reviews actually turned around and said is that it, they they found it interesting. And by the way, when I say they found it interesting, people are going to think I did it deliberately. I didn't. There, there's no <laughs> I just put sixty thousand words down quickly. Yeah. Um, the 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 two main characters, um, Mike Sharp, Steph Holgate, yeah. who are the two main characters, were always going to be the main characters in front and centre. Yeah. Even though it's Tommy that, that yeah. has the run in with the the East End gang, and I suppose Tommy and Skippy are the, yeah. the 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 two other characters that feature most prominently. And then what they what they liked about it was that the four characters are there, but the characters are in the background. Yeah. And you could see in future books those characters might get their own you know, coming to the light. And they're absolutely right to pick up on that is yeah. that there's ideas around the other the other characters as well. So I wanted to um I wanted to make it a bit of a misfits, you know, yeah. when, when we when we think about some of the movies that we've seen in the past, like Dirty Dozen and stuff yeah. like that. They are sort of the misfits within the military. You haven't really um didn't really fit in. But during that whole um I suppose uh, Iraq Afghanistan period, mm -hmm. they had a um they had their moment in time within the military, yeah. but after the end, you know, when, when um, um, and I suppose the books around just around about the the the, the first withdrawal from Afghanistan, yeah. not the one that's just happened in the last two years, but the um, as as the British military wound down, I suppose in Afghanistan, they find themselves in a situation where they don't really fit into the peacetime military, yeah. and that's really where you know, the, the idea starts because why did 10 people suddenly leave the military together? Yeah. That's sort of explained away in the book. Right. And that's where it sort of 
a little bit out of proportion. Would that have been right, in real yeah. life? Probably not, but yeah. um, it is. It's sort of explained away in the book, and then um, and then there's another character in there, uh, of course, which is the Colonel Tom, mm -hmm. who is a mysterious character and will probably remain that way. Yeah. Um, in in future books, who is ultimately pulling the strings? Yeah. Like you know, I'm sure you picked that up yeah. within the book. Ultimately, is pulling the strings. The interesting thing about Mike Sharp is how much does he really know? Yeah. I don't know if you picked up on that. Is yeah. it, you know, throughout the book is, does he know or does he not know yeah. what's going on? Um, and um, that, you know, I always think if that's a movie, that would be, <laughs> it'd be a really interesting thing for an audience to pick up on is you know, how much does this guy actually know? Yeah. And how much is he letting onto his team? How much is he just internalizing? Yeah. And how much is Tom, um, uh, you know, how much is Tom, uh, influencing him it's yeah. it, it, you know i haven't quite worked that out myself actually <laughs> but that's um yeah that's that's one of those uh, i suppose that's one of the, the the interesting the interesting side of the books but you're quite right it begins in afghanistan mm -hmm. um everything that you uh read in that first 10 pages um is is an experience right yeah um, i've been pretty close to an ied going off yeah um the pressure wave all the effects the yeah. dust all that sort of side of stuff that you get is um is real right that, yeah. that's you know from from my own experience and i haven't even been that close right yeah. i was far, far enough away uh the transition into into the um i suppose into into civil street is going to be very different for them obviously with yeah. what what happens to tommy but but the premise for the book where i actually started all those years ago mm -hmm was down to, you know, I guess like you could, you could actually relate it to some of the trouble that London's facing at yeah. the moment, you know, with street, street gangs and crime and, yeah. and stuff like that, is that, you know, nobody would ever want it, but what if the military <laughs> got involved and tried to sort that problem out? That's where the premise really started. Wow, from. that's yeah. great. So when you first started the book, when was that, 2020, was it? Yeah, 2021 too. And then when did you actually have a, 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 a sort of like a version ready to go? Uh, well, it, it published in December, so wow. December 23. So, wow. um, like I said, there, there, this is the interesting thing, is the, the journey you go on, um, and I'd be really interested if other, other authors, first-time authors felt the same, mm -hmm. is do I release, don't I release? Yeah. And so what was my goal, I suppose, at the time was, if I'm honest, it wouldn't be really cool if I published a book. Yeah. That was the, probably the first goal. Then the second goal is, wouldn't it be really cool if I publish a book and people like the book? Yeah, that would be pretty cool as well. And then, um, and then and now people are buying the book, which is which is incredible, really. I, I'm 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 blown away. Like I've achieved my first goals. Yeah, marketing is the you know, you know I'm running a business at the moment, so yeah. and that's my hundred percent priority. Yeah, marketing's the harder bit, and so you know I happen to know somebody who runs a youtube channel yeah <laughs> so uh so we 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 talked about when i was over about doing you yeah. know like a podcast or or or, or, a, or or a video on it and you've been very supportive so i appreciate yeah, that that's Thank cool you. but the um obviously i think this is probably the last question to ask you is that um I, i'm not going to say how the book ends but um and you have hinted at you know what you do for a second book but you did also say about the uh, specific uh, circumstances you're in which gave you the time to do that book yeah now very conscious you probably haven't got that time anymore so yeah that's right where it would, would be, you get time to write now <laughs> it would be um hopefully i get into a very similar position that i did for the first book is yeah. that the book's in my head ready to go right. and i just you know on weekends just start writing a chapter at a time yeah uh and get it to a position you know, get it to a point where an editor can then start help me shape the book yeah uh ready for ready for release uh if the book was you know, like um, a J.K. Rowling <laughs> Harry Potter book, then clearly um, at that I'd be talking to uh, my my the owner of the company. <laughs> but having <laughs> but having another notch under your belt now as a you know a, a published author, that must be something that you wouldn't have had in your bingo card, say ten years ago. Or no, I wouldn't have no? even thought about it really. And I think you know, like you, I, I you got to try and take the positives out of tough situations. COVID for everybody was really tough, and mm. this was my COVID you know my covid outcome if you like the positive side yeah. of covid you know enabled me to write the book and get the get the book out there um the other thing that i think you know it's enabled me to do is is to highlight some of the great work that people do i know it's a fictional book but um there are there are some extraordinary people out there and then of course you know there's a bunch of people that i know that have lost their lives as well yeah. uh defending defending their country and so um you know if i get to write 
more books it would be great to um you know remind people that yeah. that is still occurring there's a lot going on in the world today so yeah. i think people might be reminded um of what the military is there for um unfortunately um in spades in in years to come yeah but the but you you're right like it I, i've done one the second one's going to be harder because yeah. of the role that i've got at the moment but if i can get to that yeah. period of time where <laughs> I've got it in my head. I can smash it out. Yeah. Um, I, I, I will do that. And then yeah, I'm looking for good editors at that point. Cool. <laughs> well, there you go. So that's an insight. That's a valuable insight, actually. I think it does help to uh, learn about your history and then you can draw influences from your history to why you've got the book and why you've wrote a book like this. But this is available on Amazon now. And I have put all the videos, uh, the descriptions and links in the video description so you'll be able to get this for yourself but the skirmishers good read full of uh some violence lots of uh <laughs> we're not going to mention that but i really do hope you like that podcast and michael thank you for joining me today yeah thanks for having me wayne i'm back to australia tomorrow so i oh, bless you yeah 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 <laughs> take care okay thanks mate bye